I'm Joe Devine and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. In this series of short podcasts, we'll be talking to the writers of our videos, taking a more in-depth look at the topics they choose to discuss. We'll also be engaging with user comments, so if after watching a video you have follow-up questions, we have an opportunity to answer them. From Helenio Herrera to Tony Pulis. Defending is often seen as quite dull, but when you take a closer look at the complexities of defensive systems, you'll find artistry on par with the attacking game. Today, I'm joined by Alex Stewart to take a deeper look at the differences between zonal and man marking. Alex, in the video you mentioned Gianni Brera and his quote, the perfect game of football would end nil-nil. Can you expand on that a little bit and and perhaps why he would have said that? Yeah, so Brera was an Italian football journalist and considered to be one of the finest prose stylists um, writing about football. He wrote largely about Italian football in the 60s when uh, Catanaccio was popularised by the inter-team of Helenio Herrera. Now, Catanaccio wasn't invented by Herrera. Um, It was developed from a Swiss system, um, which was called the Veru, uh, invented by an Austrian coach, Karl Rappen. Um, Essentially, Catanaccio developing from the Veru was a system that deployed three solid man markers uh, in defence with a libero, and it allowed teams to nullify the opposition defensively. Um, Herrera then used uh, a a very, very um, aggressive attacking left wing back, uh, Facchetti, um, to push forward and give the side width on the left-hand side but the game was predicated on locking down the opposition. Italian football developed its reputation for being very defensive on this basis, and it was a system that Brera really admired. So I think when he's talking about games ending nil-nil, what he's saying is that you can appreciate the artistry uh, and orchestration of defence. I should probably point out that I think we actually have a video on Catanaccio on the channel already. Um, So if you haven't seen that yet and you want to go and learn a little bit more about that, um, head back to early on in the Tactics Explained playlist and you'll be able to find a video all about that. From the 1920s to the 1950s, man marking was the norm in open play. But in 1953, playing as a front man for Hungary, Nandor Hidaguti dropped into a false nine role, which exposed, as you've called it, the natural deficiency of man marking. That Hungary team uh, that enacted this switch, is, they're often discussed as one of the greatest early examples of tactical innovation. What can you tell us about that team and that period and, and why that Hungary side was so significant? So they are building on what um, Jonathan Wilson has called the Danubian school. Um, That's the the sort of central European area around the Danube uh, and includes Austria, Switzerland, Hungary. Um, The first team really to kind of play with a a deep dropping centre forward in Europe was probably the Austrian side of the 30s with a a footballer called Matthias Zindelar, who was a very willowy striker um he wasn't the the sort of big physical imposing center forward but he was incredibly skillful and in order to get away from rather brusque brutal man marking he he dropped into space uh to an extent i think hungary popularized it partly because of that victory over england um which was followed up by a 7-1 win the following year it was as much the fact that it was England that they were beating. You know, England were considered to be the the powerhouse of European football at that time. England played with a a fairly inflexible sort of WM formation at that point. And Hidaguti, by dropping into space, posed his man mark as a question. Do you follow that player or do you stay in your position and allow that player space? If you're dragged forwards... Uh, into what we would now call playing between the lines, then you create a space in the centre of defence. If you don't, you allow that player to then feed through balls into the inside forwards that are running on. And that 
obviously leaves the defence vulnerable as well. So prior to that point, teams were a lot more static up front. This Danubian school, building on what Zendela did with Austria and then into Hungary, uh, started to, to create greater fluidity up front. But I think the reason that that they are so well regarded and they're so well known is is because of those victories against England, which really showed that, you know, the, the sort of um, English hegemony of football was was threatened by what was happening in Central Europe. So it's interesting that we can pinpoint that as a, if not super significant, then quite a famous example of one of those first questions, as you call it, being posed. And I think what's really interesting about watching defending in football now is that as that tactic for attacking has evolved, the defence of teams have had to come up with much more complex and uh, much more, I suppose, contrived ways of trying to deal with those questions being asked. We did talk about flexible man marking in the video as well and how that style was most easily employed in teams with a sweeper. Obviously, the offside rule has caused the sweeper role to become slightly redundant in recent years, but you do still see examples of this style of marking in the modern game, although it's sort of adapted to what we can call countering a specific threat now. I'm thinking specifically of a recent game uh, between Manchester United and Chelsea in which Phil Jones was tasked with tracking Eden Hazard all over the pitch. So presumably that man marking style is now reserved to monitor only you know the most dangerous of opposition players. Yeah, I think that's certainly the main way that it's used. Um the next week's Umax at Whiteboard video is going to be about Jose Mourinho's into treble winning side. And one of the interesting things that he did interestingly also against Chelsea um in the round of 16 in the Champions League that year was to set his team up so that each of his players was effectively occupying a Chelsea player. Now, that's not specifically man-marking per se. It's more matching what a side is doing. In the video, we referred to how the the WM formations effectively nullified one another. And this was sort of doing the same thing, so that actually each side really only had a centre-back as a spare player, an unmarked player. Um, so I think sometimes that can be how it's done. The um, the the creation of a system that, that matches what the other side are playing man for man. And the most obvious way of doing that is, is to have a number 10 who sits on their defensive midfielder, two midfielders matching each other up and so on. What we're talking about here with, say, Phil Jones and Eden Hazard is picking a player who can be spare. Now, whether that's one of your centre-backs whether that's one of your wing backs or full backs or potentially even a defensive midfielder who just sits on an opposition player and rather than staying in a zonal space and saying, right, as a defensive midfielder, I'm going to sit really between the the defensive back four line and a midfield line of four or, or two plus two, I will just run wherever that other guy runs. And when particularly number 10s were the creative players, um, this is something that happened with Andrea Pirlo, for example. Andrea Pirlo was a uh, a, a ten, a sort of trequartista ten, who sat behind one or two strikers. But it was very easy to nullify him by just sitting a a kind of water carrier um, defensive midfielder on him, who just ran wherever he ran and squeezed him when he had the ball and tried to intercept it when it was around him and hacked him down if that didn't work. And so Pirlo withdrew into a deeper lying position, which meant that the man that was naturally opposite him was in fact the other team's creative player, and that freed him up to do what he was doing. Now, what we're talking about would be to say, let's swap out our creative player and use our effectively number 10 to sit on Pirlo and nullify what he's doing. Um, That does happen, but I think teams are very wary of sacrificing too much creativity. I think the the opposition player has to really be considered a very, very significant threat for a team to alter its shape that much. What what interests me mostly in, in these conversations about defending in football is how I think lots of people like to separate the idea of attack and defence. And I think if you take a closer look at how managers set up their tactics for a team or for a particular game, uh, attacking and defending is often just part of the same system 
you used Jose Mourinho there with Inter Milan as an example, and some people would describe Mourinho as a defensive coach. From a Premier League point of view, I think people also often mention managers like Tony Pulis when they think about coaches who are inherently defensive. Um, but I suppose you could also level the same sort of claim at someone like Pep Guardiola, who might want to push for a, a style of possession-based play. But in a way, you could say that one of the reasons the a Pep Guardiola team likes to hold onto the ball as much as they do is as a form of defence to ensure that the opposition can't have possession and therefore can't score any goals. So I think it's it's interesting that that we that we consider certain coaches defensive, certain coaches attacking, whereas really any football manager in the top level of any league is doing both. They're just choosing different ways of going about it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You can't consider one without the other. I mean, if we talk about Catanaccio, the the formation of Catanaccio was the three solid man markers at the back with a libero behind them. But that meant that the other players who were ahead of that were free to play in certain kind of roles. So the wing back was very attacking on the left. You had an inside forward high up on the right. You know, the players had attacking roles as well. And the system simply required a way of transitioning the ball to those attacking players. Now, if you look at someone like Pep Guardiola, he he is a defensive coach insofar as he absolutely thinks about how a team is best defending. From his perspective, that's about winning the ball back quickly, that's about pressing high, that's about using the touchline as an additional defender. Um, you have people like Cruyff who would talk about, you know, because Ajax players or Barcelona players when he was coaching them were pressing up so high they didn't have to run far back to to get into a defensive position because they were already so close to the ball if they if they turned it over you know you can't you can't separate out defense and attack there's a transition from one into the other um that works both ways obviously you might be attacking and then lose the ball and you need to work out how you fall back into a block you might be defending win the ball back and work out how to transition forwards and i think if a coach is characterised as one or the other, that very often simply comes down to either kind of narrative stereotyping or it comes down to how many goals have been scored. And if a team is eking out 1-0 wins, then they might be characterised as defensive. If a team is free scoring, they might be characterised as attacking. But it's very interesting to note in the Jose Mourinho inter video, which we'll see next week, um, his side, his Inter Milan side, were the top scorers in Serie A in both the seasons that he was in charge. And they also conceded the fewest goals, but does that make him an attacking coach or a defensive coach? Okay, let's have a look at some viewer comments now. Musa Stamburi is interested in an explanation as to how teams employ zonal and man marking at set pieces. So I thought, Alex, this might be a good opportunity for a brief explanation of that. Yeah, the principle is very much the same um, that, you know, obviously a set piece, if we talk about a corner, for example, the corner is going to come in from a particular side. And generally speaking, it will be aimed towards you know, around the edge of the six yard box or, or towards the penalty spot. So a team that's marking zonally will segment the six yard box and the outside of the penalty box into a series of areas and each player will be responsible for that area. Whereas man marking, simply put, you put, you know, your probably your central defenders on central defenders. You might have uh, a, an attacker who's particularly good in the air, like Diego Costa or Zlatan Ibrahimovic, both do it, who takes up that sort of edge of the six yard box position and tries to get a clearance in as well. But you're you're picking a man and you're sticking with him. A lot of people are very down on zonal marking in set pieces. And I think the reason for this is that it's very easy to miss players that are running into your zone or if you are basically overpowered. If there's an overload in a particular area where two or three players run into that area at the same time, if your defenders don't compensate for that by maybe leaving the zone that they're supposed to mark and moving across to assist a colleague then it's very easy for the attacking players to get the jump on that defender and have an opportunity to score. 
Man marking similarly can be dangerous because you can leave spare men. And if you look at, for example, how West Brom, who are probably the best corner takers in the Premier League at the moment, work, they use decoy runs very successfully, um, particularly from the six yard box out to the direction that the corner is being taken from, to draw the men that are marking those players out of the danger area to then create an overload so that the runners that are moving in from deep are moving into spaces that aren't occupied because the man markers have vacated them. Probably the best way of of marking corners is to have a mix. So you would have a couple of players that are spare and maybe occupy a zone and are responsible for you know an area around the near post and an area around the far post, but you still man mark up on the the players in the opposition that are particularly dangerous in the air. Um, I know Liverpool uh, mark zonally for a while and that, that came under significant flack because they were seeming to concede a lot that way. I think it's, as with all of these systems, it's about how well you coach it. And I'm sure that zonal marking at set pieces can work if it's coached properly and if the players are very, very aware. But I think a, a balance of the two systems is probably the most effective. It's interesting that you talk about Liverpool there because another commenter, Michael Lally, says As a Liverpool fan, I am perplexed by the use of zonal marking for set pieces. It looks disorganised and useless. I know we're not very good at set pieces, but I think that's mainly because our players are not tightly marking the opposition. Fazi Rem says another example of a destroyer, as opposed to uh, Marouane Fellaini, who we talk about in the video, would be another Manchester United player, Jisung Park. He's an interesting example, as Ferguson would sometimes play him in that same number 10 role that you described with Fellaini, but also often on the w- one, one side of a midfield four, tasked with sort of extra defensive duties, sometimes opposite wherever Ronaldo is playing. So presumably that, that would change the, the shape of the team quite significantly. Yeah, that that's a very, very good example. Um, and again, not to hop back to Mourinho, but he's fresh in my mind, but uh, he did the same thing um, against Barcelona in the Champions League the year that Inter won it using Christian Chivu, who was effectively a, a left back or a left-sided centre-back as a left midfielder, um, doubling up in front of Javier Zanetti. I think what that does is it creates uh, what we call an asymmetrical formation. So the um, if you look think back to the Hoffenheim video that we did and we talked about how Hoffenheim pendulum from one side to the other to affect a press, uh, what deploying players like uh, Chivu or, or Sung in those um, wide positions would do is effectively have that pendulum but sort of statically to one side so that one side is locked down and the other side is able to to be much more fluid and push up a lot more obviously the tendency to do that would be if you were playing a team that had a very specific threat on the other side Um, Mourinho did it because Barcelona were playing Lionel Messi down their right hand side and it was felt that having Zanetti and Chivu able to double up on Messi would reduce the chances that he could create, and it worked. Um, Park, Jisung Park, was almost more of a wing back in that respect because he had extraordinary energy and tactical discipline. Um, it's perhaps better to equate him actually with the way that Samueletto sometimes played in that Jose Mourinho side, that there was some attacking outlet from that player that he wasn't solely tasked with following the opposite attacking player he could get forward but he had a responsibility first and foremost to lock down a particular side um but yeah fuzzy's absolutely right that was a, a feature of of ferguson particularly in that uh 2007 2008 season when um Manchester United had that very, very fluid attacking front three. Sometimes one of them would be sacrificed uh, to bring in Jisung Park just to add that greater defensive solidity because he was a very, very intelligent player um, and, and he would do exactly what Ferguson asked him to. Abdi Adam notes that man marking would also drain stamina more quickly. Do you think that's a, another benefit of the general shift towards zonal marking? 
I think man marking drains stamina for both sides. Um, you know, if if you're being man marked, then you're presumably going to be running around more in an effort to shake your man marker off. So you're just as likely to get tired as your marker is. Do you think there's an argument to say as well that zonal marking, whilst it, it is potentially less physically draining, um, I suppose there's maybe more of an element of concentration because you have to focus on a few different things uh, and so, I suppose more abstract concepts rather than just following uh, your opposition player around. Yeah, I, I definitely think that. And I, I don't think it's any great surprise that zonal marking um, on on the, the whole pitch as opposed to just in set piece situations has increased as the pressing game has increased. So the the dividing up of the pitch into specific areas uh, in terms of how the players think and the the when the ball transitions into those areas, it, it triggers a press and teams now tend to move sort of as a whole shifting across the pitch or up and down the pitch in response to those pressing triggers. Zonal marking facilitates that greatly. If you're man marking, it's much, much harder to instigate a full team press because your players are going to be sort of, you know, slightly bedraggled out across the pitch as a response to where the opposition are lining up. Um, I think in terms of of the stamina argument, um, there's maybe uh, an aspect to which zonal marking preserves stamina to an extent, but then you also have to respond to those pressing triggers and that, you know, that requires energy and uh, a dynamism as well. So I I can sort of see where he's coming from, but I I think there are arguments to be put in both respects. Alex Stewart, thank you. Thanks, Joe. (laughs) 